No, and I will, I will share more on this next Sunday. But I've shared with a number of you, and you've heard me say before, that I just sense that 2024, a lot of times there's a word for the year, right? Well, it's two words. Go deeper. Go deeper. Not be content with what just lies on the surface. To not be content with doing church. To not be content with going through the motions. To not be content with an attitude of, now I lay me down to sleep. Thank you, God, for the food. Let's eat. Requiring more. That God is going to and is requiring more of us. You know, there are, there are places around the world where, let me put it this way, persecution grows a church faster than prosperity. Church blooms when it's persecuted. And that's why the fastest growing church in the world is in Iran. And I'm telling you something, folks. There are people around the world that if they, when they come to the United States and they look at the church and they see a very lukewarm, a very half-hearted approach to pressing into God, they can't figure it out. I'm not saying you're lukewarm or half-hearted. But the American church is. They look in the gospel and they go, I don't get it. Where is, where is following Jesus? Where is this at? Where have we made it about our comfort and convenience? You know, the Bible is full of prophecy. A quarter of the Bible is prophecy. Old and New Testament. And the Old Testament prophets uh, not only prophesied the coming of Messiah the first time, they also prophesied the coming of Messiah the second time, only they didn't necessarily know the difference. So we'll read some prophecy in the Old Testament that everything is together, but oftentimes as we look back, it's broken up into levels and areas of fulfillment. Uh, a lot of the Old Testament prophecy concerned Messiah. And a lot of that was fulfilled in Jesus. But a lot of it is yet to be fulfilled when he comes again and, and sets up an earthly kingdom to rule and reign forever. So when we read through the prophets, I think it's a good idea to keep in mind that they didn't necessarily understand what they were writing down. I think we can look at that, for instance, in Revelation, and we can understand that that John didn't understand what he was writing down. But he wasn't tasked with understanding it, was he? He was just told to do it. So when we, when we look at prophecy, we have to understand that there's, there's, some, there's some already but not yet to this whole thing. And that's the way that we should look at our Christian life as well. There's an already, but there's a not yet. When you talk about seeking the face of God, there's an already. I know him. I experienced him. I've been born again. I've been spirit-filled. He has carried me through. You've got some testimonies under your belt, right? But there's a lot of not yet. And if we ignore the not yet, then we're we're. We're not seeking him with all of our hearts. I've said for a couple of years now, it just seems like the way that I live every day is anticipation. I know there's something there. There's something there. I have that assurance that God is moving. That's the already. But there's that not yet. And, and you have to get comfortable with the not yet. You have to get comfortable with not being able to see everything. But you've got to keep seeking his face. Coming to God and saying, I, I want to know you more. I, I want to go deeper. I want to experience you more. And it's not so that I can get anything from you apart from simply knowing you 
better. And church, this is our attitude. This is what we have to have. This has to be our attitude going forward. Thank you, Lord, for what you've brought me from. Huh? Thank you for what you've brought me to. Thank you for what you've brought me through. And thank you for what lies ahead that right now I can't quite grasp. But it's still real. Does that make any sense? I hope so. So I do want to look at a, 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 a passage of prophecy in the Old Testament and show you a fulfillment in the New Testament that really points to this already, but not yet. <clears throat> we look in uh, Joel. Joel is one of the minor prophets, the second one in the list, uh, toward the end of the Old Testament. If you want to get comfortable finding that, it's a short one. So uh, sometimes you can go right past it. Uh, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, it's all tucked in there. And the, the book of Joel is in, in several segments. The first segment of the book of Joel is describing a, an attack of locusts that has come on the land. Uh, some people are divided as to when this was written. A lot of people believe that it was written about 800 B.C. That was a couple years ago. Uh, so when you stop and consider all that has happened since 800 B.C., this was even before the northern kingdom of Israel was taken captive by Assyria. It was way before the southern kingdom of Judah was taken captive by Babylon. Yet he speaks specifically of Judah and Jerusalem. So he, he's speaking of an attack of locusts. Now in an agricultural community and with an agricultural uh, way of life, you can just imagine that a plague of locusts would just destroy everything. And, and they would just be in no shape. There was no welfare, right? There was no programs like that. And he describes an attack that actually happened. But then he goes on to talk about a greater attack that's coming in the future. And here we get into some allegory. Uh, we, we, it says that these locusts are like soldiers climbing up a wall and that it's going to be something that they've never experienced before. And then as you read through, you find out in chapter 2 that this is sent by God, that this is an, a heavenly army sent by God. This is judgment that is coming for Judah. There's also a segment in here about what to do to get ready for that time. Then there's a section about the Holy Spirit being given, which we're going to focus on today. And then there's also a segment on restoration. So many of the prophetic books work that way. There's a story of, of God and his, his mercy uh, that he has he has endured so much from his people, right? And he's saying, listen, there's going to be judgment. You can't avoid it. But if you turn to me, I'm going to care for you, and I'm going to see you through. And the promise of future restoration, that's, that's something that's consistent in all of the prophetic books. And in Joel, there is a passage where God promises his spirit. And I'm going to read this, and then we're going to read the New Testament fulfillment of this. Joel 2, starting at verse 28. Uh, God had spoken through the prophet to tell them about things that were going to happen, judgment that was going to come, okay? And he says, then after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. See, when I get to middle age, you don't know if you're supposed to dream dreams or see visions. But <laughs> someone told me I'm probably not middle aged because I probably won't live to be 120. So uh, your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. And I will cause wonders in the heavens and on the earth blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For some in Mount Zion and Jerusalem will escape, 
Just as the Lord has said, there will be among, these will be among the survivors whom the Lord has called. Now, before he gets to this point, he issues a call to repentance, which is typical. There's a coming judgment. After the judgment, here's what's going to happen. But so many times we read in these type of uh, books, there's a call to repentance. If you know judgment is coming, that's a good time to come to repentance. So if we back up from that passage and read starting at verse 12, that is why the Lord says, turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in your grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. I like the New Living Translation, how it, re it renders this. Don't tear your clothing in your grief, tear your hearts instead. This is genuine repentance. You can go through the motions. As was very common in the Old Testament, tearing your clothes was a sign of anguish, right? It was a sign of repentance. Uh, sometimes they would wear sackcloth, very itchy, right? And, and put ashes on their head to show their remorse. But you can get good at doing that on the outside and nothing's changed inside. God is speaking to the heart right here. Don't tear your clothing, tear your heart. I mean, you come before God and you say, I'm not doing this because I want to get spared the judgment that's coming. I'm not doing this so that you give me something. I'm doing this because you are holy, because you're right in all of your judgments. And I must humble myself under the authority of my Heavenly Father. If we move ahead to Acts chapter 2, we find some similar language on the day of Pentecost. Some of you know exactly where I was going. On the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, as we read the story about how uh, there were what looked like tongues of fire. There was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And that the, the 120 who were gathered there uh, waiting upon the Lord uh, were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It caused quite a commotion, as you can imagine. With, you had a lot of people who were gathered in Jerusalem. Some people think up to a million people may have been in Jerusalem and it's uh, that would certainly push its boundaries of the old city. And they heard all this commotion and didn't know what was going on. And Peter, who we can all identify with because Peter has so many times inserts foot into mouth firmly. Well, in this case, Peter, who was rather impetuous, he stands up and he starts preaching the Word of God. And here's something that the Lord spoke, told him to say. In chapter 2, starting at verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike. And they will prophesy. This is something that they were seeing right then and there. And, and Peter, being a good Jewish boy, knew the Scriptures. He knew the prophets. And he stood up and made a statement. This is what was spoken about by the prophet Joel. And it's happening right now. So that was the already part of the fulfillment of this passage of Scripture. Suddenly everything was opened up. Did you notice? Young, old, sons, daughters servants, men, women, all of these walls had come down. It was time. The Holy Spirit had come. Not just to be given and, and taken back as in the Old Testament, but all believers in Jesus Christ could be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. 
things were being fulfilled. It was an incredible time. But Peter kept reading. He kept not reading, but kept speaking the rest of that prophecy. And he says, and I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The latter part of that did not happen and will not happen until Christ comes again. But at that time, Peter was in the already but not yet. He knows it's going to come. I don't know that Peter understood. He, it could be that he expected the rest of that to come to fruition before the day was over. Right? So here he is understanding, here is what's happening, here's what I know is going to happen. When you look back to Joel 2, it's a much further expanse of time. There was an understanding that the day of the Lord was one event. And we find out that in God's concept of time, that isn't the way that he planned it. Think about time from heaven's perspective. We get caught up on clocks. What time is it? What time does it start? When are we going to do this? And I think God has the great bird's eye view, you could say. And he sees all the things that are going to happen in earth's history as just another point on a line. He's not slow in fulfilling his promises, right? His heart is that none should perish. In the Old Testament, when Joel gave the prophecy, God spoke through him and said, because of what's going to happen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray. I want you to fast. I want you to not tear your clothing, but tear your hearts. Well, in the New Testament, preceding this statement from Peter on the day of Pentecost, those who were gathered in that upper room were doing something as well. They were in preparation. Now, we don't have a lot of details as to all of the things they did on the 10 days between Christ's ascension, or, or his ascension and when the Holy Spirit was given. But Acts 1.14 does say they all met together and were constantly united in prayer along with Mary the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. Jesus had spoken and given an answer to some people that inquired, why is it that John the Baptist disciples fast and yours don't and Jesus answered them and we find that in what was that in Luke Luke chapter 5 and he gave them a good answer I read it one day some people said to Jesus John the Baptist disciples fast and pray regularly and so did the disciples of the Pharisees. Why are your disciples always eating and drinking? Jesus responded, do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken from them, and then they will fast. The groom had just been taken from them. He had just been received into heaven. And those ten days had to be filled with a lot of questions. But the one thing that we do know they did is that they met together and were constantly united in prayer. I think it's fair to say and it's safe to assume that in addition to meeting together and praying and doing some of the business of the church, which they had to do, they were engaging in fasting. What is fasting all about? Well, it's denying ourselves of something that we so regularly partake of, and that's food. How many people like to eat? How many people enjoy food? Absolutely. Why is it, do you suppose, that God instituted this discipline for us? Well, in Joel's day, it was for repentance because they knew that judgment was coming. In New Testament era, after Calvary and the period between Calvary and Pentecost, there was a time of preparation because God was about to send something to the earth that mankind had never experienced before. 
You know, Jesus in his resurrected body in John chapter 20 got with the disciples that first Sunday night service after Easter, and he said, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So they had some understanding of the Holy Spirit, and that we might say is when the disciples were born again. But what God was getting ready to do on the day of Pentecost is something that would just blow that right out of the water. It's the difference between getting wet and being submerged. And they were about to get submerged. And there had to be a time of preparation before God could dump that on them. Why is that? Well, so that they could understand where their limitations were and how mighty God is. It was a matter of getting themselves clean. It was a matter of getting themselves ready, anticipating what was to come. They were living in the already, but not yet. But they knew that something was about to come. You know, Jesus didn't give them details on how that was all going to play out. He just said, don't leave town. Wait till the gift that I had promised comes upon you. The Father is going to send the Holy Spirit and you will receive power to be my witnesses. It was more than receiving power to speak in tongues. It was more than receiving power to stand up and preach a sermon like Peter did. It was power to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And there had to be some preparation. There had to be some fasting and some prayer. Because when you're moving from the already into the not yet, there's just so many things that are unknown. And when we take time and and follow the disciplines of special times of prayer and fasting and putting aside the everyday and looking on the face of God, he's getting us ready for the not yet. Today we have the benefit of knowing so many things, don't we? We see the Old Testament. We see... Christ's first mention of Messiah in the third chapter of Genesis. We see prophecies of Jesus unfolding before our very eyes. We see the progression of revelation. That God was entrusting more and more heavenly truths into mankind. We see the coming of Christ. We see how the very people who should have known and recognized him the most were the ones that denied him. But Scripture told us that. He came into his own. His own received him not. We have the benefit of 2020 hindsight, looking back on the events of Calvary. We we have the advantage of seeing what was to the disciples a not yet. We see that as an already. So we can look back and there are points of clarity all along the way. But now we find ourselves in a situation where even with all of that knowledge and all of that available to us, there's a lot of not yet that we don't know. And that's why I'm calling, as the prophets of old did, that we fast and pray, that we seek his face, that we let him get us ready for what is next. And customarily we do this at the beginning of the year. And I guess that's because we're so uh, used to turning that calendar page or a whole new calendar. We talk a lot about things being new. We look at the year, the year end and all of that. We're gonna do more of that next Sunday at the meeting. So it's not a bad time for us to take stock. What do I mean by fasting and praying? Well, fasting is a discipline that you have to willingly choose to do. This has to be something that you want to do. We're not tearing the clothing, we're tearing the heart. I'm not asking you to comply. I'm not asking you to do what anybody else is doing. But here are some suggestions up to how this might play out. How many of you have, uh, have fasted in the past? You know, some of us short term, some long term. There, there are several people in this congregation who 
have a long record of long-term fasting. I've never done a long-term fast. When I hear people talk about 40 days with just water, I just shake my head. But he may call me to that, right? So here's, a, here's an example, and then I'm going to tell you why we do it. You give up a meal, a meal a day, or maybe you fast for an entire day. Maybe you do a sunrise to sunset kind of a thing. Uh, perhaps you give up something that means a lot to you. Perhaps you don't eat any added sugar, or you don't eat sweets, or whatever that may be. The point is not to make you miserable. The point is that every time you feel the desire to do those things, it should automatically point you to seek his face. Yeah. This is not a diet, although you may lose some weight. This is a discipline. Discipline, that word disciple, right? Same root word. If you are a disciple of Jesus, there has to be some discipline. Part of that discipline is being part of what goes on here at the church, right? Another part of that discipline is reading your Bible, praying, spending time in His presence. Uh, maybe you like to sing, and, and there are certain worship songs or worship music that enables you just to get close to God. These are disciplines. Anything that's a discipline, there's always going to be a day that comes that you just don't feel like doing it. And if that weren't the case, it wouldn't be a discipline. If this was easy, I mean, I could give up alcohol and fish and it wouldn't bother me a bit because they don't mean I don't drink alcohol or eat fish, you know what I mean? So it has to be something that points you to Jesus. The, the worst way to fast is to think about fasting. The worst way to do this is to just say, oh, I feel awful. When am I gonna be done with this? The best way is, hey, this is a reminder that I'm going to press in and seek his face. Listen, it has to be food. You can fast technology, you can fast social media, and there may be a time to do that, but biblical fasting involves food because doggone it, it just tastes so good, and we enjoy it so much. But I'm, I'm gonna encourage you to step out in faith. Step out in faith, do something you've never done before. Trusting God to carry you through. I've made a decision for myself for the next three weeks, next 21 days, um, skip a meal a day and all added sugar, all everything. And, and then if I choose to go further than that, I will. That's my commitment. So uh, no, that means no goodies. Just skip a meal a day. And when I skip that meal, it's going to be a time of, a, of extra effort coming before the throne of God and doing a lot of what that song says. Show me your face, Lord. Show me your face. And the purpose of this is not that anyone knows you're doing it. As a matter of fact, go out of your way to not tell anybody what you're doing. The goal is not to look miserable. You've just defeated the, just go ahead and eat, right? It's not to announce it to everybody. It's to say, I want to discipline myself in my life to the point that I can be in a time of preparation for the not yet. Yes. Yes. So there's some just maybe some good ways to do this. It's good ways to think about this. First of all, it's a discipline, and I already mentioned that. This is something that we're doing so that we can grow closer to God. Uh, there, are, there are times when God asks you, all of us, to do something that's out of our wheelhouse. The majority of people don't do it. But I believe that God calls every believer to do something in addition to what they're already doing. I believe there's so much untapped potential in every believer in Jesus Christ that God every so often reaches in and says, I want you to do this. And when he does that, it takes discipline. This is a way for us to get used to it. It's a discipline. The second one is, it's a reminder. It's a reminder of how good God is. 
It's a reminder of how much we take certain things for granted. Whenever we feel that little bit of hunger, it's a reminder of why you're doing this. Why are you doing this? So you can be hungry and miserable? No, so that you can spend more time seeking his face. It's an opportunity for growth. Those who are into physical things, you train physically, you know that you gotta feel the burn, right? You gotta feel the burn. It's an opportunity for growth. If we don't stretch, we don't grow. And also, it sharpens our spiritual senses. If we can put aside some of the things that really mean so much to us, it sharpens our spiritual senses to what God wants to do in our lives. This is the least popular message I have ever preached this year. But listen, it's calling all of us to, to step in step in a little bit deeper, trust him a little bit more, commit to seeking his face because we already know about the already, but what we don't know is the not yet. The one thing we know about the not yet is God's there. <laughs> huh? The one thing that we can be convinced of of the not yet is that as we're seeking him and, 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 and seeking his face, that he is in the not yet. He will provide what we need when we get there. But it's a, 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 a disciplined effort to trust him more completely.